liturgical year of Dom Prosper Garage. The Epiphany of Our Lord. The Feast of the Epiphany is the continuation of the mystery of Christmas, but it appears on the calendar of the church with its own special character. Its very name, which signifies manifestation, implies that it celebrates the apparition of God to his creatures. For several centuries, the Nativity of Our Lord was kept on this day, and when, in the year 376, the decree of the Holy See obliged all churches to keep the Nativity on the 25th of December, as Rome did, the 6th of January was not robbed of all its ancient glory. It was still to be called the Epiphany, and the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ was also commemorated on this same feast, which tradition had marked as the day on which that baptism took place. The Greek Church gives this feast the venerable and mysterious name of Theophany, which is of such frequent recurrence in the early fathers as signifying a divine apparition. We find this name applied to this feast by Eusebius, St. Gregory Nazianzum, and St. Isidore of Pelusium. In the liturgical books of the Melkite Church, the feast goes under no other name. The Orientals call this solemnity also the Holy Lights, on account of its being the day on which baptism was administered. For, as we have just mentioned, our Lord was baptized on this same day. Baptism is called by the Holy Fathers illumination, and they who receive it illuminated. Lastly, this feast is called in many countries King's Feast. It is, of course, an allusion to the Magi, whose journey to Bethlehem is so continually mentioned in today's office. The Epiphany shares with the Feast of Christmas, Easter, Ascension, and Pentecost the honor of being called in the canon of the Mass, a day most holy. It is also one of the cardinal feasts, that is, one of those on which the arrangement of the Christian year is based, for as we have Sundays after Easter and Sundays after Pentecost, so also we count six Sundays after the Epiphany. The Epiphany is indeed a great feast, and the joy caused us by the birth of our Jesus must be renewed on it, for as though it were a second Christmas day. It shows us our incarnate God in a new light. It leaves us all the sweetness of the dear babe of Bethlehem, who hath appeared to us already in love. But to this it adds its own grand manifestation of the divinity of our Jesus. At Christmas, it was a few shepherds that were invited by the angels to go and recognize the Word made flesh. But now, at the Epiphany, the voice of God himself calls the whole world to adore this Jesus and hear him. The mystery of the Epiphany brings upon us three magnificent rays of the Son of Justice, our Savior. In the calendar of pagan Rome, this sixth day of January was devoted to the celebration of a triple triumph of Augustus, the founder of the Roman Empire. But when Jesus, our Prince of Peace, whose empire knows no limits, had secured victory to his church by the blood of the martyrs, then did this his church decree that a triple triumph of the immortal king should be substituted in the Christian calendar for those other three triumphs which had been won by the adopted son of Caesar. The 6th of January, therefore, restored the celebration of our Lord's birth to the 25th of December, but in return there were united in the one same epiphany three manifestations of Jesus' glory. The mystery of the Magi coming from the east under the guidance of a star and adoring the infant of Bethlehem as the divine king. The mystery of the baptism of Christ who, while standing in the waters of the Jordan, was proclaimed by the Eternal Father as Son of God. And thirdly, the mystery of the divine power of this same Jesus when he changed the water into wine at the marriage feast of Cana. But did these three mysteries really take place on this day? Is the 6th of January the real anniversary of these great events? As the chief object of this work is to assist the devotion of the faithful, we purposely avoid everything that would savor of critical discussion. And with regard to the present question, we think it enough to state that Baronius, Suarez, Theophilus Reynaldus, Honorius de Santa Maria, Cardinal Gaudi, Sandini, Benedict XIV, and an almost endless list of other writers assert that the adoration of the Magi happened on this very day, 
that the baptism of our Lord also happened on the 6th of January is admitted by the severest historical critics, even by Telemont himself, and has been denied by only two or three. The precise day of the miracle of the marriage feast of Cana is far from being as certain as the other two mysteries, though it is impossible to prove that the 6th of January was not the day. For us, the children of the church, it is sufficient that our Holy Mother has assigned the commemoration of these three manifestations for this feast. We need nothing more to make us rejoice in the triple triumph of the Son of Mary. If we now come to consider these three mysteries of our feast separately, we shall find that the Church of Rome in her office and Mass of today is more intent on the adoration of the Magi than on the other two. The two great doctors of the Apostolic See, St. Leo and St. Gregory, in their homilies for this feast, take it as the almost exclusive object of their preaching, though together with St. Augustine, St. Paulinus of Nola, St. Maximus of Turin, St. Peter Chrysologus, St. Hilary of Arles, and St. Isidore of Seville, they acknowledge the three mysteries of today's solemnity. That the mystery of the vocation of the Gentiles should be made thus prominent by the Church of Rome is not to be wondered at, for by that heavenly vocation which, in the three Magi, called all nations to the admirable light of faith, Rome, which till then had been the head of the Gentile world, was made the head of the Christian Church and of the whole human race. The Greek Church makes no special mention in her office of today of the adoration of the Magi, for she unites it with the mystery of our Savior's birth in her celebration of Christmas Day. The baptism of Christ absorbs all her thoughts and praises on the solemnity of the Epiphany. In the Latin Church, this second mystery of our feast is celebrated unitedly to the other two on the 6th of January, and mention is made of it several times in the office. But as the coming of the Magi to the crib of our newborn king absorbs the attention of Christian Rome on this day, the mystery of the sanctification of the waters was to be commemorated on a day apart, the day chosen by the Western Church for paying special homage to the baptism of our Savior is the octave of the Epiphany. The third mystery of the Epiphany being also somewhat kept in the shade by the prominence given to the first, though allusion is several times made to it in the office of the feast, a special day has been appointed for its due celebration, and that day is the second Sunday after the Epiphany. Several churches have appended to the mystery of the change in the water into wine that of the multiplication of the loaves, which certainly bears some analogy with it, and was a manifestation of our Savior's divine power. But whilst tolerating the custom in the Ambrosian and Mozarabic rites, the Roman Church has never adopted it in order not to interfere with the sacredness of the triple triumph of our Lord, which the 6th of January was intended to commemorate, as also because St. John tells us in his Gospel that the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves happened when the feast of the Pasch was at hand, which therefore could not have any connection with the season of the year when the Epiphany is kept. We propose to treat of the three mysteries united in this great solemnity in the following order. Today, we will unite with the Church in honoring all three. During the octave, we will contemplate the mystery of the Magi coming to Bethlehem. We will celebrate the baptism of our Savior on the octave day, and we will venerate the mystery of the marriage at Cana on the second Sunday after the Epiphany, which is the day appropriately chosen by the Church for the Feast of the Most Holy Name of Jesus. Let us then open our hearts to the joy of this grand day, and on this Feast of the Theophany, of the holy lights of the three kings, let us look with love at the dazzling beauty of our divine Son, who, as the psalmist expresses it, runs his course as a giant and pours out upon us floods of a welcome and yet most vivid light. The shepherds who were called by the angels to be the first worshipers have been joined by the Prince of Martyrs, the beloved disciple, the dear troop of innocents, our glorious Thomas of Canterbury, and Sylvester, the Patriarch of Peace. And now today, these saints open their ranks to let the kings of the East come to the babe in his crib, bearing with them the prayers and adorations of the whole human race. The humble stable is too little for such a gathering as this, and Bethlehem seems to be worth all the world besides. Mary, the throne of the divine wisdom, 
welcomes all the members of this court with her gracious smile of mother and queen. She offers her son to man for his adoration and to God that he may be well pleased. God manifests himself to men because he is great and he manifests himself by Mary because he is full of mercy. The great day, which now brings us to the crib of our Prince of Peace, has been marked by two great events of the first ages of the church. It was on the 6th of January in the year 361, and Julian, who in heart was already an apostate, happened to be at Vienne in Gaul. He was soon to ascend the imperial throne, which would be left vacant by the death of Constantius, and he felt the need he had of the support of that Christian church, in which it is said he had received the order of lector, and which, nevertheless, he was preparing to attack with all the cunning and cruelty of a tiger. Like Herod, he too would go fain on this feast of the Epiphany and adore the newborn king. His panegyrist, Ammianus Marcellinus, tells us that the crown philosopher, who had been seen just before coming out of the pagan temple, where he had been consulting the soothsayers, made his way through the porticos of the church and, standing in the midst of the faithful people, offered to the God of the Christians his sacrilegious homage. Eleven years later, in the year 372, another emperor found his way into the church on the same feast of the Epiphany. It was Valens, a Christian like Julian by baptism, but a persecutor in the name of Arianism, of that same church which Julian persecuted in the name of his vain philosophy and still vainer gods. As Julian felt himself necessitated by motives of worldly policy to bow down on this day before the divinity of the Galilean, so on this same day the holy courage of a saintly bishop made Valens prostrate himself at the feet of Jesus, the King of Kings. St. Basil had just then had his famous interview with the prefect Modestus, in which his episcopal intrepidity had defeated all the might of earthly power. Valens had come to Caesarea, and, with his soul defiled with the Arian heresy, he entered the basilica, when the bishop was celebrating with his people the glorious Theophany. Let us listen to St. Gregory Nazianzum, thus describing the scene with his usual eloquence. The emperor entered the church. The chanting of the psalms echoed through the holy place like the rumbling of thunder. The people, like a waving sea, filled the house of God. Such was the order of pomp in and about the sanctuary that it looked more like heaven than earth. Basil himself stood erect before the people as the scripture described Samuel, his body and eyes and soul motionless as though nothing strange had taken place. And, if I may say so, his whole being was fastened to his God and the holy altar. The sacred ministers who surrounded the pontiff were in deep recollectedness and reverence. The emperor heard and saw all this. He had never before witnessed a spectacle so imposing. He was overpowered. His head grew dizzy and darkness veiled his eyes. Jesus, the King of Ages, the Son of God and the Son of Mary had conquered. Balance was disarmed. His resolution of using violence against the holy bishop was gone. And if heresy kept him from at once adoring the word consubstantial to the Father, he at least united his exterior worship with that which Basil's flock was paying to the incarnate God. When the offertory came, he advanced towards the sanctuary and presented his gifts to Christ in the person of his holy priest. The fear lest Basil might refuse to accept them took such possession of the emperor that had not the sacred minister supported him, he would have fallen at the foot of the altar. Thus, has the kingship of our newborn Savior been acknowledged by the great ones of this world? The royal psalmist had sung this prophecy, The kings of the earth shall serve him, and his enemies shall lick the ground under his feet. The race of emperors, like Julian and Valens, was to be followed by monarchs, who would bend their knee before this babe of Bethlehem, and offer him the homage of orthodox faith and devoted hearts. Theodosius, Charlemagne, our own Alfred the Great and Edward the Confessor, Stephen of Hungary, the Emperor Henry II, Ferdinand of Castile, Louis IX of France, are examples of kings who had a special devotion to the Feast of the Epiphany. Their ambition was to go in company with the Magi 
to the feet of the divine infant and offer him their gifts. At the English court, the custom is still retained, and the reigning sovereign offers an ingot of gold as a tribute of homage to Jesus the King of Kings. The ingot is afterwards redeemed by a certain sum of money. But this custom of imitating the three kings in their mystic gifts was not confined to courts. In the Middle Ages, the faithful used to present on the epiphany gold, frankincense, and myrrh to be blessed by the priest. These tokens of their devotedness to Jesus were kept as pledges of God's blessing upon their houses and families. The practice is still observed in some parts of Germany, and the prayer for the blessing was in the Roman ritual until Pope Paul V suppressed it, together with several others, as being seldom required by the faithful. There was another custom which originated in the ages of faith and which is still observed in many countries. In honor of the three kings who came from the east to adore the babe of Bethlehem, each family chose one of its members to be king. The choice was thus made. The family kept the feast, which was an allusion to the third of the Epiphany mysteries, the Feast of Cana in Galilee. A cake was served up, and he who took the piece, which had a certain secret mark, was proclaimed the king of the day. Two portions of the cake were reserved for the poor, in whom honor was thus paid to the infant Jesus and his blessed mother. For on this day of the triumph of him, who, though king, was humble and poor, it was fitting that the poor should have a share in the general joy. The happiness of home was here, as in so many other instances, blended with the sacredness of religion. This custom of king's feast brought relations and friends together and encouraged feelings of kindness and charity. Human weakness would sometimes perhaps show itself during these hours of holiday making, but the idea and sentiment and spirit of the whole feast was profoundly Catholic, and that was sufficient guarantee to innocence. King's Feast is still a Christmas joy in thousands of families, and happy those where it is kept in the Christian spirit which first originated it. For the last 300 years, a puritanical zeal has decried these simple customs wherein the seriousness of religion and the home enjoyments of certain festivals were blended together. The traditions of Christian family rejoicing have been blamed under pretext of abuse as though a recreation in which religion had no share and no influence were less open to intemperance and sin. Others have pretended, though with little or no foundation, that the twelfth cake and the custom of choosing a king were mere imitations of the ancient pagan Saturnalia. Granting this to be correct, which it is not, we would answer that many of the old pagan customs have undergone a Christian transformation and no one thinks of refusing to accept them thus purified. All this mistaken zeal has produced the sad effect of divorcing the church from family life and customs, of excluding every religious manifestation from our traditions, and of bringing about what is so pompously called, though the word is expressive enough, the secularization of society. But let us return to the triumph of our sweet Savior and King. His magnificence is manifested to us so brightly on this feast. Our mother, the church, is going to initiate us into the mysteries we are to celebrate. Let us imitate the faith and obedience of the Magi. Let us adore with the Holy Baptist the Divine Lamb, over whom the heavens open. Let us take our place at the mystic feast of Cana, where our dear King is present, thrice manifested, thrice glorified. In the last two mysteries, let us not lose sight of the babe in Bethlehem, and in the babe of Bethlehem, let us cease not to recognize the great God, in whom the Father was well pleased, and the supreme ruler and creator of all things. The church begins the solemnity of the Epiphany by singing First Vespers. First Vespers of the Epiphany. Deus in Archatorium, Beam Intende, Domini ad Adjuvendum e Festina, Gloria Patria, Filio Spiritu Santo, Secret Ered in Principio, et Nuc, et in Semper, et in Secula, et Colorum, Amen, Alleluia. Dixie Donus. Antiphons, the first one. The Lord our Savior, begotten before the day star and all ages, appeared to the world on this day. Psalm 109. The Lord said to my Lord, his son, Sit thou on my right hand and reign with me. 
until on the day the last coming I make thy enemies thy footstool. O Christ, the Lord thy Father will send forth the scepter of thy power out of Zion. From thence rule thou in the midst of thy enemies. With thee is the principality in the day of thy strength, in the brightness of the saints. For the Father has said to thee, From the womb before the day star, I begot thee. The Lord has sworn, and he will not repent. He has said, speaking of thee, the God-man, thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Therefore, O Father, the Lord thy Son is at thy right hand. He hath broken kings in the day of his wrath. He shall also judge among nations in that terrible coming. He shall fill the ruins of the world. He shall crush the heads in the land of the many. He cometh now in humility. He shall drink in the way of the turn of sufferings. Therefore shall he lift up the head. The Lord our Savior, begotten before the day star, and all ages appeared to the world on this day. Second Antiphon Thy light is come, O Jerusalem, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall walk in thy light. Alleluia. Psalm 110 I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart, in the counsel of the just, and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, sought out according to all his wills. His work is praise and magnificence, and his justice continueth forever and ever. He hath made a remembrance of his wonderful works, being a merciful and gracious Lord, and being the bread of life, he hath given food to them that fear him. He will be mindful forever of his covenant with men. He is come and will show forth to his people the power of his works, that he may give them his church, the inheritance of the Gentiles. The works of his hand are truth and judgment. All his commandments are faithful, confirmed forever and ever, made in truth and equity. He has sent redemption to his people. He hath thereby commanded his covenant forever. Holy and terrible is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding to all that do it. His praise continueth forever and ever. Thy light is come, O Jerusalem, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall walk in thy light. Alleluia. Third Antiphon, opening their treasures, the Magi offered to the Lord gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Alleluia. Psalm 111, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. He shall delight exceedingly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the righteous shall be blessed. Glory and wealth shall be in his house, and his justice remaineth forever and ever. To the righteous a light is risen up in darkness, he is merciful and compassionate and just. He is born and dwells amongst us. Acceptable is the man that showeth mercy and lendeth. He shall order his words with judgment, because he shall not be moved forever. The just shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not fear the evil hearing. His heart is ready to hope in the Lord. His heart is strengthened. He shall not be moved until he look over his enemies. He hath distributed. He hath given to the poor. His justice remaineth for ever and ever. His horn shall be exalted in glory. The wicked shall see and shall be angry. He shall gnash with his teeth and pine away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Opening their treasures, the Magi offered to the Lord gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Alleluia. Fourth Antiphon. Ye seas and rivers, bless the Lord. Ye fountains, sing a hymn to the Lord. Alleluia. Psalm 112 Praise the Lord, ye children. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from henceforth, now and forever. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is as the Lord our God who dwelleth on high and looketh down on the low things in heaven and in earth? Nay, who cometh down amidst us? raising up the needy from the earth and lifting up the poor out of the dunghill, that he may place him with princes, with the princes of his people, who maketh a barren woman to dwell in a house, the joyful mother of children. Ye seas and rivers, bless the Lord. Ye fountains, sing a hymn to the Lord. Alleluia. Fifth Antiphon. This star shineth as a flame and pointeth out God, the King of Kings, the Magi saw it and offered gifts to the great king. Psalm 116 
O praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people. For his mercy is confirmed upon us, and the truth of the Lord remaineth forever. The Holy Church, after having thus celebrated the power given to the divine babe over kings, whom he shall break in the day of his wrath, his covenant with the Gentiles, whom he will give as an inheritance to his church, the light that is risen up in darkness, his name blessed from the rising to the setting of the sun, and after having, on this the day of the vocation of the Gentiles, invited all nations and all people to praise the eternal mercy and truth of God, addresses herself to Jerusalem, the figure of the church, and conjures her by the prophet Isaiah to take advantage of the light which has this day risen upon the whole human race. The Capitulum, Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, be enlightened, O Jerusalem, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Then follows the hymn. It is a beautiful one, composed by Sedulius, of which we sang the opening stanza in the Lauds of Christmas Day. In the verses selected for the present feast, the church celebrates the three epiphanies, Bethlehem, the Jordan, and Cana. Each in its turn manifested the glory of Jesus, our great King. Cruel tyrant Herod, why tremblest thou at the coming of the King our God? He that gives men a heavenly kingdom takes not from kings their earthly ones. On went the Magi, following the star that went before them, and which they had seen in the east. They seek by this light him, that is the light, and by their gifts acknowledge him to be God. The heavenly lamb touched the pure stream, wherein he deigned to be baptized. It is we who he hereby washes from our sins, for he could have none to be cleansed. At Cana, he showed a new sort of power. The water in the vases at the feast turns red, and when ordered to be poured out, lo, it had changed its nature and was wine. Glory be to thee, O Jesus, that manifestest thyself to the Gentiles and to the Father and to the Spirit of love for everlasting ages. Amen. The kings of Tharsis and the islands shall offer presents. The kings of the Arabians and of Saba shall bring gifts. The Antiphon of the Magnificat. The Magi, seeing the star, said to each other, This is the sign of the great king. Let us go and seek him and offer him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Alleluia. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he that is mighty has done great things to me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation unto generation to them that fear him. He has showed might in his arm. He has scattered up proud in the conceit of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He hath received Israel, his servant, being mindful of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. The Magi, seeing the star, said to each other, This is the sign of the great king. Let us go and seek him and offer him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Alleluia. O God, who by the direction of a star didst this day manifest thy only Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, who now know these by faith, may come at length to see the glory of thy majesty. Benedicamos Domino, Deo gracias, Fidelium anima, por misericordiam Dei, requiescat in pace. Amen. The church has thus opened her chants in honor of the divine theophany. Tomorrow, the offering of the great sacrifice will unite us all in the prayers we present to our King and Savior. Let us finish this day in recollection and joy. The maddens for the epiphany are exceedingly rich and magnificent, but as the faithful do not assist at them, we will not give them. At Milan, they are sung during the night, like the Christmas maddens, and are also composed of three nocturnes, contrary to the custom of the Ambrosian liturgy, which has only one nocturne at Madden's. The people assist at them, and altogether, these holy vigils are kept up with almost as much devotion as those of Christmas night. January the 6th. 
The day of the Magi, the day of the baptism, the day of the marriage feast has come. Our divine Son of Justice reflects upon the world these three bright rays of his glory. Material darkness is less than it was. Night is losing her power. Light is progressing day by day. Our sweet infant Jesus, who is still lying in his humble crib, is each day gaining strength. Mary showed him to the shepherds, and now she is going to present him to the Magi. The gifts we intend to offer him should be prepared. Let us, like the three wise men, follow the star and go to Bethlehem, the house of the bread of life. The Mass At Rome, the station is at St. Peter's on the Vatican, near the tomb of the Prince of the Apostles, to whom in Christ all nations have been given as an inheritance. The church proclaims in the opening chant of the Mass the arrival of the great King, for whom the whole earth was in expectation, and at whose birth the Magi are come to Jerusalem, there to consult the prophecies. Behold, the Lord, the ruler is come, and dominion and power and empire are in his hand. Give to the King thy judgment, O God, and to the King's Son thy justice. And may be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as it was beginning, is now, ever shall be world without any men. Behold, the Lord, the ruler is come, and dominion and power and empire are in his hands. After the angelic hymn, Gloria in Chelsea's, the Holy Church, all in gladness at the bright star, which leads the Gentiles to the crib of the divine king, prays in the colic that she may be permitted to see that living light for which faith prepares us and which will enlighten us for all eternity. O God, who by the direction of a star didst this day manifest thy only Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, who now know thee by faith, may come at length to see the glory of thy majesty. The lesson is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60. Arise, be enlightened, O Jerusalem, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a mist the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall walk in thy light, and kings in the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. All these are gathered together, they are come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall rise up at thy side. Then shalt thou see and abound, and thy heart shall wonder and be enlarged. When the multitude of the sea shall be converted to thee, the strength of the Gentiles shall come to thee. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Madian and Ephah. All they from Saba shall come, bringing gold and frankincense and showing forth praise to the Lord. O oh, the greatness of this glorious day, on which begins the movement of all nations towards the church, the true Jerusalem. O oh, the mercy of our Heavenly Father, who has been mindful of all these people that were buried in the shades of death and sin. Behold, the glory of the Lord has risen upon the holy city, and kings set out to find and see the light. Jerusalem is not large enough to hold all this sea of nations. Another city must be founded, and towards her shall be turned the countless Gentiles of Madian and Epha. Thou, O Rome, art this holy city, and thy heart shall wander and be enlarged. Heretofore thy victories have won thee slaves, but from this day forward thou shalt draw within thy walls countless children. Lift up thine eyes and see. All these, that is, the whole human race, give themselves to thee as thy sons and daughters. They come to receive from thee a new birth. Open wide thine arms and embrace them that come from north and south, bringing gold and frankincense to him who is thy king and ours. The gradual, all shall come from Saba, bringing gold and frankincense and publishing the praises of the Lord. Arise, be enlightened, O Jerusalem, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Alleluia, alleluia. We saw his star in the east and are come with our offerings to adore the Lord. Alleluia. Sequel, the Holy Gospel, according to Matthew chapter 2. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of King Herod, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to adore him. And Herod, hearing this, was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Christ should be born. 
But they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come forth the captain that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, privately calling the wise men, learned diligently of them the time of the star which appeared to them, and sending them into Bethlehem, said, Go, and diligently inquire after the child. And when you have found him, bring me word again, that I also may come and adore him. Who, having heard the king, went their way. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, until it came and stood over where the child was. And seeing the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And entering into the house, they found the child with Mary his mother. And falling down, they adored him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having received an answer in sleep that they should not return to Herod, they went back another way into their own country. The Magi, the first fruits of the Gentile world, had been admitted into the court of the great king, whom they had been seeking, and we have followed them. The child has smiled upon us as he did upon them. All the fatigues of the long journey, which man must take to reach his God, are all over and forgotten. Our Emmanuel is with us, and we are with him. Bethlehem has received us, and we will not leave her again, for in Bethlehem we have the child and Mary his mother. Where else could we find riches like these that Bethlehem gives us? Oh, let us beseech this incomparable mother to give us this child of hers, for he is our light and our love and our bread of life. Now that we are about to approach the altar, led by the star of our faith, let us at once open our treasures. Let us prepare our gold, our frankincense, and our myrrh for the sweet babe, our king. He will be pleased with our gifts, and we know he never suffers himself to be outdone in generosity. When we have to return to our duties, we will, like the Magi, leave our hearts with our Jesus, and it shall be by another way, by a new manner of life, that we will finish our sojourn in this country of our exile. Looking forward to that happy day when life and light eternal will come and absorb into themselves the shadows of vanity and time which now hang over us. In cathedral and other principal churches, after the gospel had been sung, the approaching feast of Easter Sunday is solemnly announced to the people. This custom, which dates from the earliest ages of the church, shows both the mysterious connection which unites the great solemnities of the year one with another, and the importance of the faithful ought to attach to the celebration of that which is the greatest of all, and the center of all religion. After having honored the king of the universe on the epiphany, we shall have to celebrate him on the day which is now announced to us as the conqueror of death. The following is the formula used for this solemn announcement. The Announcement of Easter Know, dearly beloved brethren, that by the mercy of God, as we have been rejoicing in the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, so also do we announce unto you the joy of the resurrection of the same our Savior. Except to adjacent a Sunday, will be on the day of Ash Wednesday and the beginning of the fast of Most Holy Lent will be on the blank of on the blank of blank. We shall celebrate with joy the Holy Pasch of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Diocesan Synod will be held on the second Sunday after Easter. The Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ will be on the blank of blank. The Feast of Pentecost on the blank of blank. The Feast of Corpus Christi on the blank of blank. On the blank of blank will occur the first Sunday of the Advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom our honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. During the offertory, the whole church, whilst presenting the bread and wine of God, makes use of the words of the psalmist, who prophesies that the kings of Tharsis, Arabia, and Saba, together with the new kings and people of the whole earth, would come to the newborn Savior and offer him their gifts. The offertory, the kings of Tharsis and the islands shall offer presents. The kings of the Arabians and of Saba shall bring gifts, and all the kings of the earth shall adore him. All nations shall serve him. The secret, mercifully look down, O Lord, we beseech thee, on the offerings of thy church, among which gold, frankincense, and myrrh are no longer offered. 
But what is signified by these offerings is sacrificed and received, Jesus Christ thy Son, our Lord. There is a proper preface for the Feast and Octave of the Epiphany. It celebrates the divine immortal light that appeared through the veil of our human nature, under which the Word, out of love for us, concealed His glory. It is truly meet and just, right and available to salvation, that we should always and in all places give thanks to Thee, O Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Eternal God, because when Thine only begotten Son appeared in the substance of our mortal flesh, He repaired us by the new light of His immortality. And therefore, with the angels and archangels, with the thrones and dominations, and with all the heavenly hosts, we sing a hymn to thy glory, saying unceasingly, Holy, Holy, Holy. During communion, the Holy Church, now united to him, who is her king and spouse, sings the praises of that star, which was the messenger of this Jesus. She is full of joy that she followed its light, and it has brought her to her God. We have seen his star in the east and are come with offerings to adore the Lord. Such graces as these that you have received require from you a corresponding fidelity. The church asks it for you in her post-communion. She begs of God to give you that spiritual understanding and purity which these ineffable mysteries call for. Grant we beseech thee, O Almighty God, that our minds may be so purified as to understand what we celebrate on this great solemnity. Second Vespers of the Epiphany The second Vespers of our great feast are almost exactly the same as the first. The same antiphons tell us of the Theophany, the divine apparition here below, of that eternal word begotten before the day star, and come down to us to be our Savior. Of the glory of the Lord that is risen upon Jerusalem, and of the Gentiles walking in the light he gives them of the Magi opening their treasures and laying their mystic gifts at the feet of the child or king, of the seas and rivers and fountains that are sanctified by the baptism of the God-man, and lastly, of the wonderful brightness of the star, which points out the King of Kings. But the fifth psalm is changed. Instead of the psalm which yesterday invited all nations to praise the Lord, the church sings the 113th in Exit to Israel, wherein the royal prophet, after having commemorated the deliverance of Israel, denounces the idols of the Gentiles as the works of the hands of men. All are to fall at the approach of Jesus. The adoption granted to Jacob is now extended to all nations. God will bless not only the house of Israel and the house of Aaron, but all that fear the Lord, no matter of what race or nation they may be. The antiphons and psalms are, therefore, as in First Vespers, accepting the fifth psalm, which is in exit to Israel. When Israel went out of his Egypt, the house of Jacob from a barbarous people, Judah was made his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea saw and fled, Jordan was turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, and the hills like the lambs of the flock. What ailed thee, O thou sea, that thou didst flee, and thou, O Jordan, that thou wast turned back? Ye mountains that ye skip like rams, and ye hills like lambs of the flock. At the presence of the Lord the earth was moved, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into pools of water, and the stony hills into fountains of waters. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake, lest the Gentiles should say, Where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He hath done all things whatsoever he would. The idols of the Gentiles are silver and gold, the works of the hands of men. They have mouths and speak not. They have eyes and see not. They have ears and hear not. They have noses and smell not. They have hands and feel not. They have feet and walk not. Neither shall they cry out through their throat. Let them that make them become like unto them, and all such as trust in them. The house of Israel hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. The house of Aaron hath hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. They that feared the Lord have hoped in the Lord. He is their helper and their protector. The Lord hath been mindful of us and hath blessed us. He hath blessed the house of Israel. He hath blessed the house of Aaron. He hath blessed all that fear the Lord, both little and great. May the Lord add blessings upon you, upon you, and upon your children. Blessed be you of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, 
The heaven of heaven is the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead shall not praise thee, O Lord, nor any of them that go down to hell. But we that live bless the Lord from this time now and forever. The Capitulum. Arise, be a light in O Jerusalem, for thy light is coming, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The hymn, Cruel Tyrant Herod, why tremblest thou at the coming of the King our God? He that gives men a heavenly kingdom takes not from kings their earthly ones. On went the Magi, following the star that went before them, and which they had seen in the east. They seek by this light him that is the light, and by their gifts acknowledge him to be God. The heavenly lamb touched the pure stream, wherein he deigned to be baptized. It is we whom he hereby washes from our sins, for he could have none to be cleansed. At Cana, he showed a new sort of power. The water in the vases at the feast turns red, and when ordered to be poured out low, it had changed its nature and was wine. Glory be to thee, O Jesus, that manifestest thyself to the Gentiles and to the Father and to the Spirit of love for everlasting ages. Amen. The kings of Tharsis and the islands shall offer presents. The kings of the Arabians and of Saba shall bring gifts. In the antiphon of Our Lady's Canticle, the church once more commemorates the triple mystery of today's solemnity. We celebrate a festival adorned by three miracles. This day, a star led the Magi to the manger. This day, water was changed into wine at the marriage feast. This day, Christ vouchsafed to be baptized by John in the Jordan for our salvation. Hallelujah. O God, who by the direction of a star didst this day manifest thy only Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, who now know thee by faith, may come at length to see the glory of thy majesty. On each day during the octave of this great feast, we intend giving portions from the ancient liturgies, which were used by the several churches in honor either of the triple mystery of the Epiphany, or of the coming of the wise men to Bethlehem, or of the baptism of Christ. Some of these pieces were upon the birth of the infant God, or upon the maternity of the Holy Virgin. We commence our selection for today by the hymn composed by St. Ambrose. It is used by the Church of Milan. Most High God, that thou enkindlest the fires of the shining stars, O Jesus, thou that art peace and life and light and truth, hear and grant our prayers. This present day has been made holy by thy mystic baptism, whereby thou didst sanctify those waters of Jordan, which of old were thrice turned back. It is holy by the stars shining in the heavens, whereby thou didst announce thy virginal mother's delivery, and didst on the same day lead the Magi to adore thee in thy crib. It is holy, too, by the changing the water of the pitchers into wine, which the steward of the feast, knowing that he had not so filled them, drew forth for the guests. Glory be to thee, O Lord Jesus, that didst appear on this day, and to the Father, and to the Holy Ghost, for everlasting ages. Amen. The following preface is from the Sacramentary of St. Galatius. It is truly meet and just, right and available to salvation, that we give thee praise, O Lord, for that thou art wonderful in all thy works, whereby thou hast revealed the mysteries of thy kingdom. Thus, it was that a star, the messenger of the virginal delivery, was the forerunner of this feast, a star, which proclaimed to the wandering magi that the Lord of heaven was born on the earth, that thus the God, who was to be manifested unto the world, might both be made known by a heavenly indication, and he that was to be born in time be revealed by the ministry of those signs which serve to mark time. The sequence book of the Monastery of St. Gaul contains the one we now give. It was composed in the ninth century by the celebrated Notker. Let the whole of Christendom celebrate the Feast of Christ. They are adorned in the wonderful way and are venerated by all nations. They commemorate the coming of Him that is Lord of all things and the vocation of the Gentiles. When Christ was born, a bright star was seen by the Magi, whereupon they, knowing that the splendor of such a sign could not be unmeaning, take with them gifts and offer them to the little child, as the king foretold by the star of heaven. Passing by the golden couch of a haughty prince, they set out in search of the crib of Christ. At this the cruel Herod boils with anger. He is jealous of the newborn king. 
He commands the male children of Bethlehem to be cruelly put to death by the sword. O Jesus, what an army wilt thou not levy for thy father, when in the fullness of thine age thou shalt carry on the supreme battle, preaching thy doctrines to mankind. For even now that thou art a weak babe, thou sendest such a host. Having reached his thirtieth year, this great God bowed himself down beneath the hand of his glorious servant, thus consecrating baptism for us unto the remission of our sins. Lo, the Spirit visits him in the form of the innocent dove. He is about to anoint him above all the saints and will abide with everlasting love in the dwelling of that breast. A loving voice of the Father is also heard in those ancient words, It repents me that I made man are now forgotten. Thou art, he says, my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This day, my son, have I begotten thee. All ye people, hear this, your teacher. Amen. The Menea of the Greek Church gives us the following fine stanzas in the hymn for the Nativity of our Lord. I hear the angels singing at Bethlehem, Gloria in El Chelsea's Deo. I hear them tell us that there is peace on earth to men of goodwill. Oh, see that virgin, she is lovelier than the heavens. For from her has risen a light to them that sat in darkness, exalting humble hearts that sing, as did the angels, Gloria in El Chelsea's Deo. Rejoice, O Israel, sing forth praise, all ye that love Sion. The chain of Adam's condemnation is broken. Paradise is open to us. The serpent is weakened for woman, whom he had deceived in the beginning is now before his gaze, the mother of the Creator. O oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! She that had brought death, the work of sin, into all flesh, is now, through the mother of God, made the source of salvation. For of her is born a little child, who is the all-perfect God, and who, by his birth, did but consecrate the virginity of his mother. By his swathing bands, he loosened the chains of sin, and by his own infancy, he comforted the pangs of childbirth to sorrowing Eve. Let every creature now keep choir and be glad, for Christ has come that he may reclaim mankind and save our souls. Thy nativity, O Lord our God, brought to the world the light of knowledge, for by it they that had adored the stars were taught by a star to adore it, the Son of Justice, and acknowledge thee as the Orient from on high. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Eden has been opened in Bethlehem. Come, let us go and see. We shall find the hidden treasure. Come, let us go and possess in the cave the things that are in paradise. Here it is that there has appeared the unwatered root that has budded forth our pardon. Here is the well not dug by human hand, of whose water David heretofore desired to drink. Here a virgin has brought forth a child, by whom she quickly slacks the thirst of Adam and David. Therefore, let us go with quicker haste to the place where is born the new babe, who is God before all ages. Rejoice, ye just. Be glad, ye heavens. Exalt, ye mountains. Christ is born. The virgin, cherub-like, sits bearing on her lap God. The word may flesh. The shepherds are giving glory to the babe. The magi are offering gifts to the Lord. The angels are singing this hymn. O incomprehensible God, glory be to thee. Let us recite the following prose, composed by the pious monk Herman Contractus. It will assist us to honor the ever-blessed Mother of our Jesus. Hail Mary, beautiful star of the sea, that hast risen by God's mercy to give light to all nations. Welcome, O gate open to none but God. Thou bringest into the world the light of truth, the very Son of Justice clad in human flesh. O Virgin, thou beauty of the world, Queen of Heaven, brilliant as the sun, lovely as the moon's brightness, think on all us who love thee. The ancient fathers and prophets, full of faith, longed for thee to be born, the rod of the fair root of Jesse. Gabriel spoke of thee as the tree of life, that, by the dew of the Holy Spirit, shouldest bring forth the divine flowering almond tree. T'was thou didst lead the Lamb, the King that rules the earth, from the rock of the desert of Moab to the mount of the daughter of Zion. T'was thou didst free the world of its destroying sin by crushing the angry Leviathan, the crooked and bar serpent. We, therefore, the remnants of the nations, in honor of thy dear memory, call down upon our altar there to be mystically immolated the Lamb that reigns eternally in heaven, whom thou didst so wonderfully bring forth. 
the veil is now drawn aside, and we, the true Israelites, the children of the true Abraham, are permitted to fix our astonished eyes on the true manna, of which that of Moses was the figure and type. Pray for us, O Virgin, that we may be made worthy of that bread of heaven. Pray for us that, with sincere faith, we may taste of that sweet fountain, which was prefigured by the rock in the desert, and that, having our loins girt, we may safely cross the sea and be permitted to look upon the brazen serpent on the cross. Having our sandals off our feet and our lips and hearts made pure, pray for us that we may come nigh to that holy flame, the word of the Father, which thou, O Virgin Mother, didst carry within thee as the bush did the fire. Hear us, O Mary, for thy Son honors thee by granting thee all thy prayers. And thou, O Jesus, save us for whom thy Virgin Mother prays. Grant us to see the source of every good. Grant us to fix on thee the eyes of our purified souls. May our souls drink in the water wisdom and feed with understanding on the sweet food of life. Do thou, creator of the world, give us grace to adorn our Christian faith with works and by a happy death to pass from this life's exile to thee. Amen. We also, o Jesus, come to adore thee on this glorious epiphany, which brings all nations to thy feet. We walk in the footsteps of the Magi, for we too have seen the star, and we are come to thee. Glory be to thee, dear King, to thee, who didst say in the canticle of David thine ancestor, I am appointed king over Zion, the holy mountain, that I may preach the commandment of the Lord. The Lord has said to me that he will give me the Gentiles for mine inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for my possession. Now therefore, O ye kings, understand, receive instruction ye that judge the earth. Thou wilt say, O Emmanuel, with thine own lips, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And a few years after, the whole earth will have received thy law. Even now Jerusalem is troubled. Herod is trembling on his throne. But the day is at hand when the heralds of thy coming will go throughout the whole world, proclaiming that he who was the desired of nations is come. The word that is to subject the earth to thee will go forth, and like an immense fire, will stretch to the uttermost parts of the universe. In vain will the strong ones of this world attempt to arrest its course. An emperor will propose to the Senate, as the only means of staying the progress of thy conquest, that thy name be solemnly enrolled in the list of those gods whom thou comest to destroy. Other emperors will endeavor to abolish thy kingdom by the slaughter of thy soldiers, but all these efforts are vain. The day will come when the cross, the sign of thy power, will adore the imperial banner. The emperors will lay their crown at thy feet, and proud Rome will cease to be the capital of the empire of this world's strength and power in order that she may become forever the center of thy peaceful and universal kingdom. We already see the dawn of that glorious day. Thy conquest, O King of Ages, begin with thine epiphany. Thou callest from the extreme parts of the unbelieving East the first fruits of that Gentile world, which hitherto had not been thy people, and which is now to form thine inheritance. Henceforth, there is to be no distinction of Jew and Greek, of barbarian and Scythian. Thou hast loved man above angel, for thou hast redeemed the one, whilst thou hast left the other in his fall. If thy predilection for a long period of ages was for the race of Abraham, henceforth thy preference is to be given to the Gentiles. Israel was but a single people. We are numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars of the firmament. Israel was under the law of fear. Thou hast reserved the law of love for us. From this day of thy manifestation, O divine king, begins thy separation from the synagogue, which refuses thy love. And on this same day, thou takest in the person of the Magi, the Gentiles, as thy spouse. Thy union with her will soon be proclaimed from the cross, when turning thy face from the ungrateful Jerusalem, thou wilt stretch forth thy hands towards the nations of the Gentiles. O ineffable joy of thy birth, but O still better joy of thine epiphany, wherein we, though once disinherited, are permitted to approach to thee, offer thee our gifts, and see thee graciously accept them, O merciful Emmanuel. Thanks be to thee, O infant God, for that unspeakable gift of faith, which, as thy apostle teaches us, hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into thy kingdom, making us partakers of the lot of the saints in light. 
Give us grace to grow in the knowledge of this thy gift, and to understand the importance of this great day, whereon thou makest alliance with the whole human race, which thou wouldest afterwards make thy bride by espousing her. O oh, the mystery of this marriage feast, dear Jesus, a marriage, says one of thy vicars on earth, a marriage, says one of thy vicars on earth, that was promised to the patriarch Abraham, confirmed by oath to King David, accomplished in Mary when she became mother, and consummated, confirmed, and declared on this day, consummated in the adoration of the Magi, confirmed in the baptism in the Jordan, and declared in the miracle of the water changed into wine. On this marriage feast, where the church thy spouse already receives queenly honors, we will sing to thee, O Jesus, with all the fervor of our hearts, these words of today's office, which sweetly blend the three mysteries in the one, that of thy alliance with us. Antiphon of Lauds. This day is the church united to the heavenly spouse, for Christ in the Jordan washes away her sins. The Magi run to the royal nuptials with their gifts, and the guests of the feast are gladdened by the water changed into wine. Alleluia.